It's wonderful to be back in Rogers City on the shores of Lake Huron, which in my estimation is the greatest of the Great Lakes. <laughs> many people, many people when they first see Lake Huron um, are surprised. Its size and vistas seem more fitting of an ocean or a sea rather than a mere lake. Those of you who live on the shore or who work on the water, Lake Huron is, is like a slightly moody friend. And I think we take a lot of pride in knowing the lake, its moods, its quirks, its weather. But what if I were to tell you there is a vast undiscovered country with broad plains, towering cliffs, majestic waterfalls that exist just beyond your shoreline? There is such a country, and I'm going to describe it to you tonight. Our story begins at the very end of the last ice age. The vast continental glaciers gouged the Huron Basin out of solid rock. And as the ice gradually, grudgingly withdrew, those frigid meltwaters began to fill the basin. At the same time, relieved of the great weight of ice, the Earth's surface actually began to rise in a process known as isostatic rebound. Now this interplay of filling waters and rising earth caused the level of this new lake to fluctuate wildly from levels much higher than today and levels much lower than today. That low level is known as Glacial Lake Stanley and it's named after the geologist George Stanley who first inferred its existence in 1936. Between about 11,000 years ago and 9,000 years ago, this lake existed with water levels that were more than 300 feet lower than modern Lake Huron. The basin was isolated from the other Great Lakes, and in fact, it contained two lakes, a shallow eastern lake and a deeper, uh, deeper eastern lake and a shallow western lake. And they were separated by a formation of limestone and dolomite known as the Alpena Amberley Ridge. Now, this ridge had resisted the glacial ice. Now, mariners have known about this feature for a long time. It appears on your nautical charts. It's called Six Fathom Bank, 36 feet. Fortunately, it's in the middle of the lake and away from the main shipping channels. But it formed a continuous causeway between southern Ontario and northern lower Michigan, actually right up here by Presque Isle. Now, this time period has been very perplexing for archaeologists. Despite the long span of time, very few sites are known, and those that are known are deeply buried. Yet, as the lake levels begin to slowly rise, we suddenly see sites everywhere on the lakeshore. Well, what's happening? Is this some cultural phenomena? Is it population growth? So as an experiment, Dr. Ashley Lemke of the University of Texas Arlington plotted all the finds of dated caribou bone in Michigan. And here's what she found. During the high water stand, caribou fossils are common. During Lake Stanley, they're none, just like the archeological sites. So clearly both the people and the animals are someplace else. This is an aerial view of the Huron Basin during Lake Stanley's time. And this is what I call a Canadian eye view of the world. You're north, you're looking south. Everything in green is dry land today. Everything that's brown is land that was available for occupation during Lake Stanley. This is a vast area, more than a thousand square miles. The modern lake shores are far removed from the water. No wonder we don't find sites on land. The sites are underwater. And if we're going to find them, that's where we have to look for them. So the starting point is what are we looking for? What are they going to look like? And here the present gives us a lot of clues. The principal animal that these hunters would be chasing is the caribou. And the caribou is a truly fascinating creature, and we know a lot about him. Uh, we know they existed in vast herds. We know that they preferred a paraglacial climate like would have existed during Lake Stanley's time. We know that they predictably migrate to summer pasture and winter calving grounds and they have one odd behavioral quirk. They are attracted and follow lines. This is one of the reasons that the caribou migrations were so disrupted by the original pipelines in Alaska. Now, 
caribou hunters know about this quirk too. So instead of like in the Western United States where panicked herds of bison were stampeded over cliffs, caribou hunters create lines. They make them out of rock, out of brush, and it's enough to channel the movement of animals to predetermined kill locations. Now some of these structures still exist today in the Arctic, in fact some are still used. This is an aerial view of the Edgington site, that whole long line is simply a line. And if we look at it on the ground, you can see what it actually looks like. This line wasn't restraining where the animals could move. It was simply guiding them. In the foreground, you actually have a recently used hunting blind. Again, it doesn't take much concealment during this period of migration. So this basically told us what we were looking for. We expect there to be caribou migrating back and forth along the Alpena Amberley Ridge. We expect hunters to be using this kind of technology to go after them. And since stone is plentiful on the, on the ridge, we expect these constructions to be made of stone, which has a high acoustic reflectivity, which means we'll see it with sonar. We can, we can actually detect it. So we now know what we're looking for. Where do we look? The first problem is figuring out what this environment looked like 9,000 years ago. Now the bathymetry gives you the basic topography, and interestingly, side scan sonar actually can tell you where there were lakes, rivers, and marshes. Uh, as you can see here, and you can do that because these areas are sand, and sand is lower reflectivity. So in this picture, you can actually see a small lake connected by a river to a big lake, it's the darker color. We supplemented this with samples of material like uh, testate amoeba and pollen that are very sensitive to environmental conditions. Oh, and yeah, there are still rooted trees that were preserved on the bottom as well. Dr. Lisa Sonnenberg took all of this data and from it constructed a very detailed map of this 9,000 year old environment. Okay, we now know what the place looked like. Where are the hunting sites going to be? For this, we turn to computer simulation. Dr. Robert Reynolds at Wayne State University is an expert on artificial intelligence and learning, and he specializes in group decision-making. And his, he and his students set out to, to determine where the caribou would have actually tracked along the Alpena Amberley Ridge. And the way they did this is they created numerous caribou automata. And then they let these herds loose on the ridge and they gradually learned it as they migrated back and forth and back and forth. And as they learned this, the computer kept track of their routes. Now this was the very preliminary work that, that, that's progressed much beyond that now, but there are two important observations that came from this initial, this initial study. First of all, it seems that there are certain places that the migrating animals always pass. This is where you want to put your hunting site. It also turned out that the path that the animals followed in the fall was somewhat different than that in the spring. In the fall, it's a more rambling, circuitous route. In the spring, it's more dead on, let's get there. And this is gonna be significant later in the story. So now we knew what we were looking for and we had an idea of where to look for it. As archeologists underwater, we employ a multi-tier strategy. We start out with a large scale survey using side scan and multi-beam. And from this, we identify key targets we want to identify. From that, we then deploy a remote operating vehicle, an ROV. This, this is Jake. He, he is actually a celebrity in his own right. He has a Facebook page if you want to friend him. But he also has twin video cameras. He has aligned lasers in the front which will allow you to scale the images. And he has an acoustic pinger that lets us know precisely where he's located. And you need this because GPS doesn't work underwater. So if Jake investigates it and it looks good, we then deploy scuba trained archeologists. The archeologists uh, photograph the structures, they map the features, they collect environmental samples, and they also collect bulk samples of sediment which are brought back to the surface and screened looking for cultural, cultural material. Now in the first few years of our work, we were fortunate enough to find a few of these sites and some associated artifacts. And as we did, we fed this information back to Bob Reynolds and his team as they updated their virtual world simulation. So 
Scientific research really is a kind of voyage of discovery. It has odd twists and turns and blind alleys, and you often don't appreciate what's really important until afterwards, and you can, and you can kind of look back. The breakthrough for our research came in the form of an email, an email from Bob Reynolds' students that said, we think we know what season your hunting blinds are being used. Now this would be a big deal. Archaeologists typically use animal bone and particularly teeth to work out the season of hunting. But in the Great Lakes, and, and really for most of northeastern North America, animal bone rarely survives because the acid soils destroy them. So how did these kids, who'd never had an anthropology class, never been to the Arctic, never seen a caribou, how do they know the season of these hunting sites? Well, they noticed that there was a geometry to the hunting sites and that many of them would only work if the animals were moving in a single direction. And they then plotted out what these directions would be and they aligned with the fall and the spring migration. They were right. And from this came a second observation. The hunting structures that are associated with the spring migration were different than the ones with the fall migration. Now, if we go back and think about the, the hunting structures we found now, and we've, we've probably identified more than 70 potential structures in the 10 years we've been working, you can divide them into kind of simple and complex. The simple structures like these tend to be comprised of five rocks or arranged in kind of a V formation. They could perhaps conceal two or three hunters. They're typically situated in a place where the, the natural features will tend to channel the animals towards them. And you often will find several of these in a single locality. We also here find these odd rectangular constructions. And these resemble very closely meat caches that historic hunters used in the Arctic. Now by contrast, the complex sites which are associated with the spring are much more elaborate. They often create their own funneling structure. They have multiple hunting blinds built into them, and they also often have outlying stations, which may have been additional hunting blinds. It may have been where hunters were positioned to keep the animals moving towards them. These were much larger structures. They involved a lot more people to operate. But as of yet, we've never found one of those rectangular caches associated with them. So what we, what we come away with is in the fall, we seem to have small structures, small numbers of hunters storing meat. In the spring, we seem to have large structures, lots of people not storing meat. How do we, how do we fit all this together into a single, into a single picture? I think the most plausible explanation is that we're seeing different seasonal poses on a single annual round. That round begins in the autumn when people move to the ridge to basically provision for winter. In the fall, the animals are in their prime condition, not just the meat, but the hide, sinews, and antler. And these small family groups are going out there they're preserving some of the, some of the meat they've, they've acquired in these stone caches. Now winter on the Alpena Amberley Ridge would be a positively miserable place. A frigid, wet, cold rock. No one in their right mind would spend the winter out there. So we believe the people came back west to the tree line, the shelter of the tree line in Michigan. Uh, we've actually looked for some of these sites on land, these terrestrial sites. We've found several possible candidates, but almost certainly most of the sites are both underwater and buried deeply beneath lake sediments. Now, as the winter progressed, we imagined teams setting out across that near frozen lake to go to their caches and retrieve meat. At the end of winter, with stores exhausted, we imagine hungry hunters returning to the Alpena Amberley Ridge. These family groups that have been scattered during the winter are now converging on those key migration points where the elaborate structures are located. And the goal is food for immediate consumption. And there's plenty, and there's plenty to go around. And the hunters, since it's a poor season for storing food, can actually afford to linger 
which is a huge luxury for a hunter-gatherer. They can renew acquaintances. They can swap stories. Come summer, the people disperse again. Now, we don't yet know where they go in the summer. We don't know what they do. Perhaps they hunt isolated animals. Maybe like us, they fished. But you get this annual cycle. The research on the Alpena Amberley Ridge, I think, is important for a number of reasons. For one, it has given us an incredibly detailed picture of life in the Great Lakes 9,000 years ago. And it's done this in large part because the sites survive intact underwater. It also gives us a model from deep in the past that is quite different from what we see post-contact in the historic era. All of the pieces are familiar and recognizable, but they fit together in a very different and novel way. The Alpena Amberley Ridge truly is Lake Huron's undiscovered country. But so too is the past in a broader sense. It's a country we can never hope to visit, but it's a place we can hope to know via the vestiges of it which linger in the present. Thank you.